The Chiefs have rookies. They have offensive tackles. But do they need Frank Clark? We'll talk about that today on Locked on Chiefs. From the land of the free and the home of the Chiefs, this is the Locked on Chiefs podcast. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, and Matt Derrick from ChiefsDigest.com, our man on the ground on the Chiefs beat. Thanks for making us your first listen here on the Lockdown Podcast Network. We are the Lockdown Chiefs show. Your first listen today could lead to another one for another team, maybe the Bengals, maybe the Raiders. Uh, Raiders don't want to talk very much lately, especially about Patrick Mahomes. Good job, Tyree Wilson. So uh, uh, a lot to pull out there. We have to go over where the rookies stand, what's going on inside the organization. Some more transactions today after the initial signings. We'll get to that in just a minute. I'm Ryan Tracy, the founder of Rogue Analytics and Performance Consulting, home of the Athletic Matrix and the Draft Guide, as well as NFL33.com, where you can find all my thoughts and my team's thoughts about the league in general and RGR football. This is Matt Derrick from ChiefsDigest.com. Matt, I thought it was done, and then we had a couple more transactions today after a wave of signings yesterday. Yeah, it's hey, the, sometimes the cleanup after a rookie minicamp can, can take a couple of days to work through and everything. And and there'll be more to come because um you know, rookie minicamps for other teams coming up this week. So there's probably be bound to be a couple of players that turn the Chiefs down. Um that maybe went some other, another team's minicamp this week and they're going to another team this coming weekend. And then after that, you know, there may be some more players that the Chiefs are interested in at least kicking the tires on and maybe bringing in for the phase three of OTA. So yeah, the bottom of that roster, as Brett Veach likes to say, if he can improve the 90th guy in the roster, he's going to try to at every turn. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, the guys that have parted ways it is um, Monte Braswell from Missouri State, uh, Blake Haynes, Tarleton State, uh, have been uh, released, uh, waived it is technically. And Sebastian Gutierrez, the uh, tackle from Minot State, has been brought onto uh, the list here. So there's still at least one gap. I think there's a couple of actual spaces still left. So let's see what happens. But um, as we go through this process, like you said, there, there are other options back and forth. It could be other tryouts. So from your perspective, seeing and knowing what we know about what's going on inside the Chiefs facility now, why would a rookie free agent want to come to Kansas City? Not only is it hard to get on the 90, it's next to impossible to get on the 53 as an undrafted guy. What would be the impetus to come here? Well, I mean, there's a couple of reasons and, you know, and everybody has their own different motivations. Remember, I mean, of the what, eight, close to 80 players, I guess, that were in this camp, mini camp and everything, 51 of them were tryout players. And and those guys are just trying to punch a lottery ticket. So, you know, some of them, Chiefs might have been their only option. I mean, that might have been their only invitation. Um, and like I said, remember that, you know, the NFL split into two groups. Half of them do their mini camps this week when the Chiefs did in the first week after the draft. The rest of the league will do theirs this coming weekend. So there's opportunities for players to double dip so they can go to Chiefs and they can go to somebody else if they don't stick in Kansas City. But it depends on the position, too. I mean, we've seen, you know, uh, linebackers, edges, you know, running backs wanting to come to Kansas City because they do see that maybe there's some roster spotters. There's at least the competition that they could enter for some of those positions. Um, you know, some of those 51, I mean, honestly, they're probably coming to try out because it gives them a chance to say they were Kansas City Chief for a weekend. And, <laughs> you know, and and Andy Reid, you know, talked about it in his press conference on Monday, you know, as being that that's a big deal for a lot of these guys. I mean, they do the team picture at the end of the mini camp, And for the majority of the players that were there on the field, that might be their only moment in the NFL. So it's a big deal. Now, for the undrafted free agents, I mean, it, hey, ultimately, usually money talks. And, you know, there's a few of those situations where the Chiefs just maybe went a little bit further as far as the guaranteed money on the contract, a little bit of a signing bonus. Uh, you know, there's you're not you're not given undrafted free agent rookies extensive deals. I mean, they're all getting about the same money. It's just the guarantee that's different. And sometimes a, roster, a signing bonus, it's a little bit different. So that's how you can entice players, honestly. I mean, if the opportunity's not there, give them the money. Yeah, hey, that, that's the easiest way. The guy that stands out there is Nick, um, not Nick Jones, sorry, uh, Cam Jones from Indiana, the linebacker who, who did get, what, 130 in that guaranteed, which is a sizable chunk. We've talked about that in the past. Is anything over 100K is, is getting into that point where you're you're the priority free agent guy. Now, he's in a unique position with the arrival of Drew Tranquil. Obviously, you have Leo Chanel still at the linebacker position. I don't see them moving him anytime soon. So you're four deep on the linebacker list right now. 
Jack Cochran's a guy who played special teams. The only way to make this roster, in my opinion, for Cam Jones is special teams. But do you think that there's a real competition there? Or do you think that this is just feeling it out and that guarantee is just because they felt he had a grade high enough that it warranted it, whether he makes uh, the practice squad or not? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the thing about those those this, the guarantees and the signing bonuses included in some of these these undrafted free agent deals, is that they're they're not really significant numbers to the salary cap, but they're significant to the player. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. these are guys. Some you know, even though with NIL, some of them are getting money. It's still to be the first check that a lot of them ever cash playing football. If they could get one hundred thirty five thousand guaranteed for one weekend, I mean, that's a pretty good deal. So, uh, but usually bigger money means the bigger and the more likely that the team is going to be stay invested in a player. And that's why a player will go towards the big money because if a team has given them a priority free agent deal, like 135,000, Chiefs are usually aren't going to, most teams aren't going to just walk away and say that they lit that money on fire for three days. I mean, they're going to make sure if they can, you know, make sure it's tested out and run it out a little bit. And you're right. I mean, you look at Kansas City and you would say, hey, there's four linebacker spots secured barring an injury um there's probably five jobs available so you're in competition with jack cochran and if you're an undrafted free agent at the top of your class and you're looking at another undrafted free agent from last year that never got any snaps on defense i think you're thinking to yourself that's a favorable competition for you um cochran played well last year but i mean not to a point where you would just simply say it's that job is his and there's there's no way that he's losing it anybody could come in and take that job yeah and I think that's going to be an interesting competition. It's one of the the camp uh, ball outs that I, that I really need to see here in the next couple of weeks to get an idea of what we're looking at going into camp. But it's not the only one. Uh, a lot of turnover again today at the offensive tackle position. We're going to see how that's going to shake out, see what Matt's take is on it right after this message. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. If you need to find your path forward, BetterHelp is here to help you. It's easy, it saves you time, and it gives you what you need in order to get started. There's a lot that you can get from therapy, and this is the way to go. It helps me stay focused, uh, run my business, and make sure that I'm on top of everything that I have to cover because there are more hours in the day than there are things to do. I think what you want to start thinking about is whether you want to start therapy or not. And if you do, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and easy to suit for your schedule. It revolves around you, not the other way around. It makes things easier. You fill out a brief questionnaire. You get matched with a therapist. You try that out. If you don't feel that connection, you can switch therapists at any time for free with no additional charge. It makes life easy. You can find your balance with BetterHelp right now at BetterHelp dot com slash locked on you can get 10 percent off of your first month that's better h-e-l-p dot com slash locked on now i need all the help that i can get uh better or otherwise so i need help right now matt figuring out what where are we in this offensive tackle situation i am of one camp that feels like plan a didn't come together plan b didn't come together and now we're somewhere in the cd range but is this all backups upon backups, or is this at this point uh, with the, the roster churn going on as at the backup positions in particular, is this just trying to make the most of a situation that you're not very happy that you're in for the Kansas City Chiefs? Yeah, I think it's it's two things. I mean, one, there's there's only been one transaction in the last week that you would say is meaningful as far as comp- camp competition goes and, and starting lineup and opening week roster. And that's, you know, that's going to be Devonte Smith. Um, you know, that's the, the one position that you're going to say, okay, he's coming in. That's going to, ch- that's potentially changing your starting lineup. The rest of this, I mean, it's about balancing your roster for, for OTAs and for mini camp. I mean, the chiefs were very light on the offensive line, even heading into mini camp. I mean, they added a lot of bodies over the, over the, before heading into mini camp to, you know, at least be able to bulk up that camp a little bit, but they want to have at least, you know, usually 15, 16, up to 18 linemen for OTAs and mini camp, because remember you want three teams. So you would like to have ideally three offensive line groups and you need some backups too. So it's not, not a problem. If you've got too many guys, you know, there, it's really a problem. You don't have enough in order to make sure that everybody's got the proper breaks and that you've got people working in the right skill groups. I mean, yeah, you know what? 
it's, people think it's a little bit of overkill, but there's a reason why that, you know, for, for mini camp practices and for training camp that they have three teams and there's a reason for it and it's a proven successful method. So that's way to go about it. But um, I think, yeah, I mean, wh what you're talking about for the most part is, is traveling and, and really shifting that third team. And hey, a third teamer can always make it. I mean, Andrew Wiley was a third teamer when he came to this team. So mm -hmm. third teamers can only be, always become starters one day, but that's where most of the churn has been right now is just trying to find those guys who can compete at the bottom of the roster. Now, are you surprised about the designation? A, I mean, we didn't actually speak about the Donovan Smith signing a until afterwards, um, but the, the whole thing of talking up Juwan playing on the left and then now he's going back to the right, which is his natural position, which I always thought was probably the, the easiest transition. That feels more like that was pre-draft smoke trying to set themselves up so everybody didn't realize, although they should have, that they, their top priority was getting a left tackle. It didn't quite work out. Um, but does that bother you now? And do you think that that has anything to do with performance or will in any way cloud the situation going through OTAs and camp? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. It's like because it's what do you do? What do we truly know and think was was Brett Veach's ideal plan? I mean, in theory, one concludes would and, and I think the, the conventional wisdom was that still Orlando Brown was always their plan A. I'm less convinced of that. I think that decision was probably made a lot earlier than we've acknowledged and, and really truly understand. I don't think that that was a March 15th decision. I think that was made much earlier that, you know, Orlando Brand wasn't going to be a part of the team's plan. So um, it's not even clear to me that in this offseason that they really tried to keep Orlando Brown. So if that's the case, you can cross that out as plan A. So what was plan A? Well, was it Donna or excuse me, mm -hmm. <laughs> was it Juwan Taylor with plan A? I don't know. I, I I can't necessarily say there was another free agent out there, but the Chiefs and Brett Veach have made a convincing, at least to me, consistent line of thinking, which has been that from day one of this offseason, they've been talking about versatility and, you know, and flexibility that and they've pursued that at every angle. I mean, they've been trying to find guys who can honestly play both left and right side. Mm -hmm. So to get Jawan Taylor. And, and Brett Veach was pretty clear and said, well, hey, you know what? If we don't sign anybody else, we don't draft anybody else, he can be the left tackle. Well, they go out and they sign Donovan Smith, and Donovan Smith is a left tackle. And if healthy, he's better on the left side than a lot of other people. And I've got plenty of reason to believe that, that he's going to be fine. I mean, he's coming off an elbow injury which elbow injuries absolutely ruin your pass protection skills. And as evidenced last year, his pass protection was terrible. Uh, he was better against the run, which your elbow is not involved. You're not reaching as much and in, in, in blocking for the run. So that makes sense. And it's not a, an, an issue to a, a knee or an ankle injury that's going to zap his base. I mean, so I think there's plenty of reasons to believe that you're going to get closer to the 2021 Donovan Smith than 2022. And if that's the case, the Chiefs are going to be fine. But if not, I mean, they've gone into this with the idea that, hey, Juwan Taylor can always flip over to the left, but it's harder to do the other thing. It's harder to go in and say, you know what, Juwan Taylor's going to be left tackle. Donovan Smith would then be the right? Or is he your swing? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So, right. you know, and, and then if that's not the case, then who's your starter on the right side? Is it Lucas Niang? Is it Wanya Morris? I mean, you got a lot of, and see, I, I don't think that, I think that while well, I hear a lot of Chiefs fans talking about and whether or not the, that's the plan, I don't I don't think that was that's ever been a part of Brett Veach's consideration. What I want to know what Brett Veach's plan is, what's the plan for 2024? Because mm -hmm. that's what's going to inform this year. Because if their plan is that, you know, Jawan Taylor is going to be the left tackle in 24, he should be playing left tackle right now. If if Devon if Devon Donovan Smith is going to be your left tackle in 24, well then play him right there now and trying to re-sign him. If Wanye Morris or someone else is going to be your left tackle in 24, great opportunity to apprentice for a year under a really good left tackle to learn to drill and to get acclimated and get experienced. Lucas Niang would fit into that category too because he needs mm -hmm. the same thing. I mean, coming back from the injury, so. I think that everything that the Chiefs have done and said, I think, has, has been very consistent as far as how the plan has come together. It's just that they didn't advertise the plan, and Donovan Smith's edition kind of came out of the blue. I mean, it surprised me. I'll be, I'll admit, I was surprised because I was surprised he was still in the market. I figured he was <laughs> 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 like, how can this guy still be out there? Um, and it was a favorable deal. So I, I don't think that there's, I don't think the Chiefs feel terrible about the position that they're in at all. I mean, if anything, I think that that they're 
backup plan has come true. Was was their ideal to get a left tackle in the first round? I think there's a reason to believe that that was pretty strong, that there's a lot of smoke there. And if that's the case, hey, it didn't work out. But did their next plan hit? Yeah, I think I think that it's this was this was nothing spur of the moment. I mean, this was something that if they didn't get their left tackle in the draft, they knew Donovan Smith was there. That was going to be their next next move, and they got it done. Yeah, it, it makes perfect sense. And now Wani Morris is in a position where he has experience on left and right, uh, was way more successful on the right-hand side. So you think he, he'd be more in the mix there. But now you have a guy that it's kind of built to be a swing as a backup with a, a rookie that needs a year. He can fill in both sides. He can practice both sides. They can get a feel for what can he be capable of in 24. I think that's a smart way about it. The question becomes to me is I've heard zero since draft day about Lucas Nyang. You're the only person that mentioned him to me. So does that mean that the plan does not include Lucas or it's just a giant question mark about his health at this point? It's a giant question mark. I mean, you know, Brett Veach told me exactly that in in Indianapolis, um, that they they like Lucas. They just don't know where he's at because he has not been on the field for more than a handful of snaps in the last year since the knee injury. And that's no way to evaluate a player. I mean, you've got to be able to see them in in, in consistent game situations. And that's why a preseason would be very important for Lucas Niang. But if you're the Chiefs, you can't go into what into August preseason games waiting to find out if your starting right tackle is fully healthy or not. And you're not going to find out during OTAs. You're not going to find out during a, you know less than full contact, less than full speed team drills. I mean, that's just you're not going to do that. So, um, I mean, they're I, th- I think that they're protected in a lot of different ways. Now, the question is going to be what happens if and when injuries hit? You know, what do you do then? Now you're you're feeling like maybe you're maybe you were a couple of weeks ago, which is you know, is this team deep enough at this position to weather an injury or two? That I think is a debatable question. I kind of feel like that as well, and folks. If you want more about this, Chris and I went over the tackle situation uh, before these these recent roster changes yesterday. We are here five days a week. Remember that all off season long. We're going to be here tomorrow. We're going to discuss the whole defensive end position. But right now, coming up next, we're going to give you a preview with Matt leading the way about what this possibility really is. And if this is part of a plan as well, plans within plans within plans, what about Frank Clark coming up next? So, Matt, I come back to this. Chris Jones is very playful on Twitter. Um, you know, until Twitter completely implodes, I think we, we have that as a source of a couple of little hints of things going forward. Um, an investment was made into Charles and Another investment was made into, uh, Felix and Adike Uzama, uh, as well as BJ Thompson. Like you have edges here that you're trying to bring along. I'm not against bringing Frank Clark in, but the question to me is if you're setting the table for that to happen, if you're Brett Veach, what are you looking to put on that table? What does the situation have to involve? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, if you're if you're bringing in Frank Clark, I mean, I think there's a couple of things that you're acknowledging. And and one of them is that, you know, you're not completely sold that you've addressed the position immediately for the short term. And and I say that, even you know, we're pointing out the fact that, hey, Charles and Minnie, making a lot of money, but hasn't necessarily posted the production to, you know, maybe justify that. So I think, I mean, if you're going into the season without a little bit of of concern about Amenahu and how he's going to respond in a larger role, I mean, I think you're being a little naive. Um, But you can be optimistic and still protect yourself at the same time. And that's what Frank Clark would do. I mean, I'll admit, I mean, to me, it's hard to see at this point a good way to structure that defensive line unless you're talking about a lot of guys having some flexibility to be able to kick inside, maybe be in multiple positions. But, you know, if you're talking about trying to build a five man rotation on the edge and, you know, and Frank Clark is your fifth guy in that rotation. Well, that's a much better role for Frank Clark than Frank Clark being the highest paid guy in the rotation. And, and if he comes back to Kansas city, I mean, it is going to be under a low cost incentive driven deal And I would have zero problems with that. I mean, for all the Frank Clark criticism that there has been in the past and, you know, in the public, there has never been any complaints with Frank Clark in that building. I mean, you know, he's been a good mentor to the George Carl office last season. He's always been a good teammate. You've seen with Chris Jones. Chris Jones obviously is a big fan of Frank Clark to get along great. Frank loves Kansas City. Um, And I felt all along that if there was not a team out there willing to give Frank Clark a long term deal, and the security and the, the kind of that one more one last bag of money that I know Frank would like to get in his career, 
-hmm. Kansas City was going to be a backup. So, you know, the the likelihood of Frank Clark coming back to Kansas City to me was one of those things that dropped off a cliff when when they released him. Um, but it's increased slowly but surely every single day since then, because the longer he's on the market, the more and more it makes sense for both sides. Well, and I think the mentoring is a good aspect there. I feel like a minute you can play first down out on edge and move inside on passing downs and, and rush next to Chris. Uh, obviously, we know that George Karloftis can do that as well, so that gives you another edge possibility there. Uh, rotational snaps that Frank could take at edge. But he's very good at setting the, the, the edge in the run. So that will bring Felix along. It may help, actually, in getting uh, the actual edge set uh, on some first downs against particular teams uh, rather than a many or rather than George. So I do feel it's a cog that could fit in there, but I think the biggest aspect is continuing to develop George Karloftis and giving Felix Anadike Uzama somebody to emulate that has been there, done that. Nothing against a many, but I don't know that his, his experience counts for that. Um, and when I look at the film, I think a many who is ju just as productive inside as he is out at the edge. So Gut feeling. Do you think this is something that can actually come to fruition before camp? Yeah, I think I think it is. I mean, you know, definitely Brett Veach, we know, is always on the market for veteran edges throughout the season. So it wouldn't be the first time that he's added somebody into the summer. It wouldn't be the first time if he they waited until August. It wouldn't be the first time if they waited until the season to get it done. Um, I yeah, it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me in, at all. And frankly, I mean, given Frank's age, it wouldn't surprise me if he wanted to wait until maybe June, uh, not having to be out in the, that Kansas City heat in May and June. That was over 90 degrees for the rookie meeting camp this weekend. So that might be a little incentive right there for, for Frank to say, you know what, might take the veteran prerogative and, you know, I'll wait until June 15th to sign that contract and then I'm back, guys. Yeah, there you go. Well, we'll see what happens and I'm sure we'll check in with you as soon as it does. But I thank you for spending the time. I know it's just the beginning, folks, as we start to rev up on the early part of the 2023 season. We'll have more with Matt from ChiefsDigest.com. Go get all of his work there, as well as more for you tomorrow. We're going to go over what all the combinations are and how we see the defensive end position shaking out. And then be with us live on Thursday night when we're going to have the schedule release live show to give you what you guys want more than anything I know to know when the Chiefs are playing whom and who they're starting with. I'm guessing it's Cincy, but we'll find out then. Matt, thanks for your time today. Boy, that would be a good one. Let's, let's cross our fingers. I'm with you. I'm on the page with that one. Have a great one, folks. We'll talk to you tomorrow.